When, in April, the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, and all the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. When also Zephyrus, with his sweet breath, exhales an air in every grove and heath upon tender shoots, and the young sun, his half-course in the sign of the ram, has run, and the small fowl are making melody that sleep away the night with open eye, so nature pricks them and their heart engages, then people long to go on pilgrimages, and palmers long to seek the stranger strands of far-off saints, hallowed in sundry lands, and specially from every shire's end in England, down to Canterbury they wend, to seek the holy blissful martyr, quick to give his help to them when they were sick. It happened in that season that one day in Southwark, at the Tabard, as I lay ready to go on pilgrimage and start for Canterbury, most devout at heart, at night there came into that hostelry some nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk, happening then to fall in fellowship, and they were pilgrims all that towards Canterbury meant to ride. The rooms and stables of the inn were wide, they made us easy, all was of the best. And shortly, when the sun had gone to rest, by speaking to them all upon the trip, I soon was one of them in fellowship, and promised to rise early and take the way to Canterbury, as you heard me say. But nonetheless, while I have time and space before my story takes a further pace, it seems a reasonable thing to say what their condition was, the full array of each of them, as it appeared to me, according to profession and degree, and what apparel they were riding in, and at a night. I therefore will begin. There was a knight, a most distinguished man, who, from the day on which he first began to ride abroad, had followed chivalry, truth, honour, generousness, and courtesy. He had done nobly in his sovereign's war, and ridden into battle, no man more, as well in Christian as heathen places, and ever honoured for his noble graces. When we took Alexandria, he was there. He often sat at table in the chair of honour above all nations when in Prussia. In Lithuania he had ridden, and Russia, no Christian man so often of his rank. When, in Granada, Algeciras sank under assault, he had been there, and in North Africa, raiding Benamarin. In Anatolia he had been as well, and fought when Ias and Italia fell. For all along the Mediterranean coast he had embarked, with many a noble host. In fifteen mortal battles he had been, and jousted for our faith at Tramacene thrice in the lists, and always killed his man. This same distinguished knight had led the van once, with the Bay of Belat, doing work for him against another heathen Turk. He was of sovereign value in all eyes, and though so much distinguished, he was wise, and in his bearing, modest as a maid. He never yet a boorish thing had said in all his life to any, come what might. He was a true, a perfect, gentle knight. Speaking of his equipment, he possessed fine horses, but he was not gaily dressed. He wore a fustian tunic, stained and dark with smudges, where his armour had left mark. Just home from service, he had joined our ranks to do his pilgrimage and render thanks. He had his son with him, a fine young squire, a lover and cadet, a lad of fire, with locks as curly as if they had been pressed. He was some twenty years of age, I guessed. In stature, he was of a moderate length, with wonderful agility and strength. He'd seen some service with the cavalry in Flanders and Artois and Picardy, and had done valiantly, in little space of time, in hope to win his lady's grace. He was embroidered like a meadow, bright and full of freshest flowers, red and white. Singing, he was, or fluting all the day. He was as fresh as is the month of May. Short was his gown, the sleeves were long and wide, he knew the way to sit a horse and ride, he could make songs and poems and recite, knew how to joust and dance, to draw and write. 
He loved so hotly that till dawn grew pale, he slept as little as a nightingale. Courteous he was, lowly and serviceable, and carved to serve his father at the table. There was a yeoman with him at his side, no other servant, so he chose to ride. This yeoman wore a coat and hood of green, and peacock-feathered arrows bright and keen and neatly sheathed hung at his belt the while. For he could dress his gear in yeoman style, his arrows never drooped their feathers low. And in his hand he bore a mighty bow. His head was like a nut, his face was brown. He knew the whole of woodcraft up and down. A saucy brace was on his arm to ward it from the bowstring. And a shield and sword hung at one side, and at the other slipped a jaunty dirk, spear sharp and well equipped. A medal of St. Christopher he wore, of shining silver on his breast, and bore a hunting horn, well slung and burnished clean, that dangled from a baldric of bright green. He was a proper forester, I guess. There also was a nun, a prioress. Her way of smiling very simple and coy. Her greatest oath was only, By Saint Loy! And she was known as Madame Eglantine. And well she sang a service, with a fine intoning through her nose, as was most seemly, and she spoke daintily in French, extremely, after the school of Stratford at Bow, French in the Paris style she did not know. At meat her manners were well taught withal, no morsel from her lips did she let fall, nor dipped her fingers in the sauce too deep, but she could carry a morsel up and keep the smallest drop from falling on her breast. For courtliness she had a special zest, and she would wipe her upper lip so clean that not a trace of grease was to be seen upon the cup when she had drunk. To eat, she reached a hand sedately for the meat. She certainly was very entertaining, pleasant and friendly in her ways, and straining to counterfeit a courtly kind of grace, a stately bearing fitting to her place, and to seem dignified in all her dealings. As for her sympathies and tender feelings, she was so charitably solicitous she used to weep if she but saw a mouse caught in a trap if it were dead or bleeding. And she had little dogs she would be feeding with roasted flesh or milk or fine white bread. And bitterly she wept if one were dead or someone took a stick and made it smart. She was all sentiment and tender heart. Her veil was gathered in a seemly way, her nose was elegant, her eyes glass grey. Her mouth was very small but soft and red. Her forehead certainly was fair of spread, almost a span across the brows I own. She was indeed by no means undergrown. Her cloak, I noticed, had a graceful charm. She wore a coral trinket on her arm. A set of beads, the gaudies, tricked in green, whence hung a golden brooch of brightest sheen, on which there first was graven a crowned A, and lower, a more winked omnia. Another nun, the chaplain at her cell, was riding with her, and three priests as well. A monk there was, one of the finest sort, who rode the country. Hunting was his sport, a manly man, to be an abbot able, Many a dainty horse he had in stable. His bridle, when he rode, a man might hear jingling in a whistling wind, as clear eye and as loud as does the chapel bell where my lord monk was prior of the cell. The rule of good St. Bennet or St. Moore, as old and strict, he tended to ignore. He let go by the things of yesterday and took the modern world's more spacious way. He did not rate that text at a plucked hen which says that hunters are not holy men, and that a monk uncloistered is a mere fish out of water flapping on the pier, that is to say, a monk out of his cloister. That was a text he held not worth an oyster, and I agreed, and said his views were sound. Was he to study till his head went round poring over books in cloisters? Must he toil as Austin bad and till the very soil? Was he to leave the world upon the shelf? Let Austin have his labor to himself. This monk was, therefore, a good man to horse. Greyhounds he had as swift as birds to course. Hunting a hare or riding at a fence was all his fun. He spared for no expense. 
I saw his sleeves were garnished at the hand with fine gray fur, the finest in the land. And on his hood, to fasten it at his chin, he had a wrought gold, cunningly fashioned pin into a lover's knot, it seemed to pass. His head was bald and shone like looking-glass. So did his face, as if it had been greased. He was a fat and personable priest. His prominent eyeballs never seemed to settle. They glittered like the flames beneath a kettle. Supple his boots, his horse in fine condition. He was a prelate fit for exhibition. He was not pale like a tormented soul. He liked a fat swan best and roasted whole. His palfrey was as brown as is a berry. There was a fra, a wanton one, and merry, a limiter, a very festive fellow. In all four orders there was none so mellow, so glib with gallant phrase and well-turned speech. He'd fixed up many a marriage, giving each of his young women what he could afford her. He was a noble pillar to his order. Highly beloved and intimate was he with county folk within his boundary and city dames of honour and possessions, for he was qualified to hear confessions, or so he said with more than priestly scope, he had a special licence from the Pope. Sweetly, he heard his penitents at shrift with pleasant absolution for a gift. He was an easy man in penance-giving, where he could hope to make a decent living, it's a sure sign whenever gifts are given to a poor order that a man's well shriven, and should he give enough, he knew in verity the penitent repented in sincerity. For many a fellow is so hard of heart he cannot weep for all his inward smart. Therefore, instead of weeping and of prayer, one should give silver for a poor friar's care. He kept his tippet stuffed with pins for curls, and pocket-knives to give to pretty girls. And certainly his voice was gay and sturdy, for he sang well and played the hurdy-gurdy. At sing-songs he was champion of the hour. His neck was whiter than a lily-flower, but strong enough to butt a bruiser down. He knew the taverns well in every town, and every innkeeper and barmaid, too, better than lepers, beggars, and that crew. For in so eminent a man as he, it was not fitting with the dignity of his position, dealing with a scum of wretched lepers. Nothing good can come of dealings with the slum and gutter dwellers, but only with the rich and victual sellers. But anywhere a prophet might accrue, courteous he was, and lowly of service, too. Natural gifts like his were hard to match. He was the finest beggar of his batch, and, for his begging district, paid a rent. His brethren did no poaching where he went. For though a widow mightn't have a shoe, so pleasant was his holy how-d'you-do, he got his farthing from her just the same before he left, and so his income came to more than he laid out. And how he romped just like a puppy! He was ever prompt to arbitrate disputes on settling days, for a small fee, in many helpful ways. Not then appearing as your cloistered scholar with threadbare habit hardly worth a dollar, but much more like a doctor or a pope. Of double worsted was the semi-cope upon his shoulders, and the swelling fold about him, like a bell about its mould when it is casting, rounded out his dress. He lisped a little out of wantonness to make his English sweet upon his tongue. When he had played his harp, for having sung, his eyes would twinkle in his head as bright as any star upon a frosty night. This worthy's name was Hubert, it appeared. There was a merchant with a forking beard and motley dress, high on his horse he sat, upon his head a Flemish beaver hat, and on his feet daintily buckled boots. He told of his opinions and pursuits in solemn tones, and how he never lost. The sea should be kept free at any cost, he thought, upon the Harwich Holland range. He was expert at currency exchange. This estimable merchant so had set his wits to work, none knew he was in debt. He was so stately in negotiation, loan, bargain, and commercial obligation. He was an excellent fellow all the same. To tell the truth, I do not know his name. An Oxford cleric, still a student, though, one who had taken logic long ago, was there. His horse was thinner than a rake, 
and he was not too fat, I undertake, but had a hollow look, a sober stare. The thread upon his overcoat was bare. He had found no preferment in the church, and he was too unworldly to make search for secular employment. By his bed, he preferred having twenty books in red and black of Aristotle's philosophy to having fine clothes, fiddle, or psaltery. Though a philosopher, as I have told, he had not found the stone for making gold. Whatever money from his friends he took, he spent on learning or another book, and prayed for them most earnestly, returning thanks to them thus for paying for his learning. His only care was study, and indeed he never spoke a word more than was need. Formal at that, respectful in the extreme, short to the point and lofty in his theme. The thought of moral virtue filled his speech, and he would gladly learn and gladly teach. A sergeant at the law who paid his calls wary and wise for clients at St. Paul's there also was of noted excellence. Discreet he was, a man to reverence, or so he seemed his sayings were so wise. He often had been justice of a size by letters patent and in full commission. His fame and learning and his high position had won him many a robe and many a fee. There was no such conveyancer as he. All was fee simple to his strong digestion. Not one conveyance could be called in question. Nowhere there was so busy a man as he, but was less busy than he seemed to be. He knew of every judgment, case, and crime recorded ever since King William's time. He could dictate defences or draft deeds. No one could pinch a comma from his screeds, and he knew every statute off by rote. He wore a homely party-coloured coat girt with a silken belt of pinstripe stuff. Of his appearance I have said enough. There was a Franklin with him, it appeared. White as a daisy petal was his beard. A sanguine man, high-coloured and benign, he loved a morning sop of cake in wine. He lived for pleasure and had always done, for he was Epicurus's very son. In whose opinion sensual delight was the one true felicity in sight. As noted as St. Julian was for bounty, he made his household free to all the county. His bread, his ale were the finest of the fine, and no one had a better stock of wine. His house was never short of bake meat pies, of fish and flesh, and these in such supplies it positively snowed with meat and drink, and all the dainties that a man could think. According to the seasons of the year, changes of dish were ordered to appear. He kept fat partridges in coops beyond. Many a bream and pike were in his pond. Woe to the cook whose sauces had no sting, or who was unprepared in anything. And in his hall a table stood arrayed and ready all day long, with places laid. As justice at the sessions, none stood higher. He often had been member for the shire. A dagger and a little purse of silk hung at his girdle, white as morning milk. As sheriff, he checked all audit every entry. He was a model among landed gentry. A haberdasher, a dyer, a carpenter, a weaver and a carpet maker were among our ranks, all in the livery of one impressive guild fraternity. They were so trim and fresh, their gear would pass for new. Their knives were not tricked out with brass, but wrought with purest silver, which avouches a like display on girdles and on pouches. Each seemed a worthy burgess, fit to grace a guild hall with a seat upon the dais. Their wisdom would have justified a plan to make each one of them an alderman. They had the capital and revenue, besides, their wives declared it was their due. And if they did not think so, then they ought. To be called madam is a glorious thought. And so is going to church, and being seen having your mantle carried like a queen. They had a cook with them who stood alone for boiling chicken with a marrow bone, sharp flavouring powder, and a spice for savour. He could distinguish London ale by flavour, and he could roast and seethe and broil and fry, make good thick soup and bake a tasty pie. But what a pity, so it seemed to me, that he should have an ulcer on his knee. 
As for Blamange, he made it with the best. There was a skipper hailing from far west. He came from Dartmouth, so I understood. He rode a farmer's horse as best he could in a woolen gown that reached his knee. A dagger on a lanyard falling free hung from his neck, under his arm and down. The summer heat had tanned his colour brown. And certainly he was an excellent fellow. Many a draught of vintage, red and yellow, he'd drawn at Bordeaux while the trader snored. The nicer rules of conscience he ignored. If, when he fought, the enemy vessel sank, he sent his prisoners home. They walked the plank. As for his skill in reckoning his tides, currents, and many another risk besides, moons, harbours, pilots, he had such dispatch that none from Hull to Carthage was his match. Hardy he was, prudent in undertaking. His beard in many a tempest had its shaking, and he knew all the havens as they were from Gotland to the Cape of Finister, and every creek in Brittany and Spain. The barge he owned was called the Maudelaine. A doctor, too, emerged as we proceeded. No one alive could talk as well as he did on points of medicine and of surgery. For, being grounded in astronomy, he watched his patient's favourable star and, by his natural magic, knew what are the lucky hours and planetary degrees for making charms and magic effigies. The cause of every malady you'd got he knew, and whether dry, cold, moist, or hot, he knew their seat, their humour and condition. He was a perfect practising physician. These causes being known for what they were, he gave the man his medicine, then and there. All his apothecaries in a tribe were ready with the drugs he would prescribe, and each made money from the other's guile. They had been friendly for a goodish while. He was well versed in Esculapius, too, and what Hippocrates and Rufus knew. And Dioscorides, now dead and gone, Galen and Rhazes, Harley, Serapion, Averroes, Avicenna, Constantine, Scotch Bernard, John of Gaddesden, Gilbertine. In his own diet he observed some measure. There were no superfluities for pleasure, only digestives, nutritives and such. He did not read the Bible very much. In blood-red garments, slashed with bluish-gray and lined with taffeta, he rode his way. Yet he was rather close as to expenses, and kept the gold he won in pestilences. Gold stimulates the heart, or so we're told. He therefore had a special love of gold. A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us, somewhat deaf, which was a pity. In making cloth, she showed so great a bent she bettered those of Ypres and of Ghent. In all the parish, not a dame dared stir toward the altar steps in front of her. And, if indeed they did, so wroth was she as to be quite put out of charity. Her kerchiefs were of finely woven ground. I dared have sworn they weighed a good ten pound the ones she wore on Sunday on her head. Her hose were of the finest scarlet red and garted tight. Her shoes were soft and new. Bold was her face, handsome and red in hue. A worthy woman all her life, what's more, she'd had five husbands all at the church door, apart from other company in youth. No need just now to speak of that, forsooth. And she had thrice been to Jerusalem, seen many strange rivers and passed over them. She'd been to Rome and also to Boulogne, St. James of Compostella and Cologne and she was skilled in wandering by the way. She had gap teeth set widely, truth to say. Easily on an ambling horse she sat, well wimpled up, and on her head a hat as broad as is a buckler or a shield. She had a flowing mantle that concealed large hips, her heels spurred sharply under that. In company she liked to laugh and chat, and knew the remedies for love's mischances, an art in which she knew the oldest dances. A holy-minded man of good renown there was, and poor, the parson to a town. Yet he was rich in holy thought and work. He also was a learned man, a clerk, who truly knew Christ's gospel and would preach it devoutly to parishioners, and teach it.
benign and wonderfully diligent, and patient when adversity was sent, for so he proved in great adversity, he much disliked extorting tithe or fee. Nay, rather, he preferred beyond a doubt giving to poor parishioners round about from his own goods and Easter offerings. He found sufficiency in little things. Wide was his parish, with houses far asunder, yet he neglected not, in rain or thunder, in sickness or in grief, to pay a call on the remotest, whether great or small, upon his feet, and in his hand a stave. This noble example to his sheep he gave, first following the word before he taught it, and it was from the gospel he had caught it. This little proverb he would add thereto, that if gold rust, what then will iron do? For if a priest be foul in whom we trust, no wonder that a common man should rust. And shame it is to see, let priests take stock, a soiled shepherd and a snowy flock. The true example that a priest should give is one of cleanness, how the sheep should live. He did not set his benefice to hire and leave his sheep encumbered in the mire, or run to London to earn easy bread by singing masses for the wealthy dead, or find some brotherhood and get enrolled. He stayed at home and watched over his fold so that no wolf should make the sheep miscarry. He was a shepherd and no mercenary. Holy and virtuous he was, but then never contemptuous of sinful men, never disdainful, never too proud or fine, but was discreet in teaching and benign. His business was to show a fair behavior and draw men thus to heaven and their Saviour, unless, indeed, a man were obstinate. And such, whether of high or low estate, he put to sharp rebuke, to say the least. I think there never was a better priest. He sought no pomp or glory in his dealings. No scrupulosity had spiced his feelings. Christ and his twelve apostles and their lore he taught, but followed it himself before. There was a ploughman with him there, his brother. Many a load of dung one time or other he must have carted through the morning dew. He was an honest worker, good and true, living in peace and perfect charity, and, as the gospel bade him, so did he, loving God best with all his heart and mind, and then his neighbour as himself, repined at no misfortune, slacked for no content, for steadily about his work he went to thrash his corn, to dig or to manure or make a ditch, and he would help the poor for love of Christ and never take a penny if he could help it. And, as prompt as any, he paid his tithes in full when they were due on what he owned, and on his earnings, too. He wore a tabard smock and rode a mare. There was a reeve, also a miller there, a college manciple from the inns of court, a papal pardoner, and, in close consort, a church court summoner, riding at a trot, and, finally, myself. That was the lot. The miller was a chap of sixteen stone, a great stout fellow, big in brawn and bone. He did well out of them, for he could go and win the ram at any wrestling show. Broad, knotty, and short-shouldered, he would boast he could heave any door off hinge and post, or take a run and break it with his head. His beard, like any sow or fox, was red, and broad as well, as though it were a spade, and at its very tip his nose displayed a wart on which there stood a tuft of hair red as the bristles in an old sow's ear. His nostrils were as black as they were wide. He had a sword and buckler at his side. His mighty mouth was like a furnace door. A wrangler and buffoon, he had a store of tavern stories, filthy in the main. His was a master hand at stealing grain. He felt it with his thumb, and thus he knew its quality, and took three times his due. A thumb of gold, by God, to gauge an oat. He wore a hood of blue and a white coat. He liked to play his bagpipes up and down, and that was how he brought us out of town. The manciple came from the inner temple. All caterers might follow his example in buying victuals. He was never rash, whether he bought on credit or paid cash. He used to watch the market most precisely and go in first, and so he did quite nicely. Now isn't it a marvel of God's grace that an illiterate fellow can outpace the wisdom of a heap of learned men? 
His masters, he had more than thirty then, all versed in the abstrusest legal knowledge, could have produced a dozen from their college, fit to be stewards in land and rents and game to any peer in England you could name, and show him how to live on what he had debt-free, unless, of course, the peer were mad, or be as frugal as he might desire, and they were fit to help about the shire in any legal case there was to try. And yet, this manciple could wipe their eye. The reeve was old and choleric and thin. His beard was shaven closely to the skin. His shorn hair came abruptly to a stop above his ears, and he was docked on top just like a priest in front. His legs were lean, like sticks they were. No calf was to be seen. He kept his bins and garners very trim. No auditor could gain a point on him. And he could judge, by watching drought and rain, the yield he might expect from seed and grain. His master's sheep, his animals and hens, pigs, horses, dairies, stores and cattle pens, were wholly trusted to his government. And he was under contract to present the accounts right from his master's earliest years. No one had ever caught him in arrears. No bailiff, serf, or herdsman dared to kick— he knew their dodges, knew their every trick. Feared like the plague he was by those beneath. He had a lovely dwelling on a heath, shadowed in green by trees above the sward. A better hand at bargains than his lord, he had grown rich, and had a store of treasure well tucked away, yet out it came to pleasure his lord with subtle loans or gifts of goods, to earn his thanks and even coats and hoods. When young, He'd learnt a useful trade, and still he was a carpenter of first-rate skill. The stallion cob he rode at a slow trot was dapple grey, and bore the name of Scott. He wore an overcoat of bluish shade and rather long. He had a rusty blade slung at his side. He came, as I heard tell, from Norfolk, near a place called Balderswell. His coat was tucked under his belt and splayed. He rode the hindmost of our cavalcade. There was a summoner with us in the place who had a fire-red cherubinish face, for he had carbuncles. His eyes were narrow. He was as hot and lecherous as a sparrow. Black, scabby brows he had, and a thin beard. Children were afraid when he appeared. No quicksilver, lead ointments, tartar creams, boracic, no, nor brimstone, so it seems, could make a salve that had the power to bite, clean up, or cure his whelks of knobby white, or purge the pimples sitting on his cheeks. Garlic he loved, and onions too, and leeks, and drinking strong wine till all was hazy. Then he would shout and jabber as if crazy, and wouldn't speak a word except in Latin when he was drunk, such tags as he was pat in. He only had a few, say two or three, that he had mugged up out of some decree. No wonder, for he heard them every day, and, as you know, a man can teach a jay to call out Walter better than the Pope. But had you tried to test his wits and grope for more, you'd have found nothing in the bag. Then Questio Quid Juris was his tag. He was a gentle varlet and a kind one, no better fellow if you went to find one. He would allow, just for a quart of wine, any good lad to keep a concubine a twelve-month and dispense it altogether. Yet he could pluck a finch to leave no feather. And if he found some rascal with a maid, he would instruct him not to be afraid in such a case of the archdeacon's curse, unless the rascal's soul were in his purse, for in his purse the punishment should be. Purse is the good archdeacon's hell, said he, but well I know he lied in what he said. A curse should put a guilty man in dread, for curses kill, as shriving brings, salvation. We should beware of excommunication. Thus, as he pleased, the man could bring duress on any young fellow in the diocese. He knew their secrets. They did what he said." He wore a garland set upon his head, large as the holly bush upon a stake outside an alehouse, and he had a cake, a round one, which it was his joke to wield as if it were intended for a shield. He and a gentle pardoner rode together, a bird from Charing Cross of the same feather, 
just back from visiting the court of Rome. He loudly sang, Come hither, love, come home. The summoner sang deep seconds to this song. No trumpet ever sounded half so strong. This pardoner had hair as yellow as wax, hanging down smoothly, like a hank of flax. In driblets fell his locks behind his head, down to his shoulder, which they overspread. Thinly they fell, like rat tails, one by one. He wore no hood upon his head, for fun. The hood inside his wallet had been stowed. He aimed at riding in the latest mode. But for a little cap his head was bare, and he had bulging eyeballs like a hare. He'd sewed a holy relic on his cap. His wallet lay before him on his lap. Brimful of pardons come from Rome, all hot. He had the same small voice a goat has got. His chin no beard had harboured, nor would harbour, smoother than ever chin was left by barber. I judge he was a gelding, or a mare. As to his trade, from Berwick down to Ware, there was no pardoner of equal grace. For in his trunk he had a pillowcase which he asserted was Our Lady's veil. He said he had a gobbet of the sail St. Peter had the time when he made bold to walk the waves, till Jesu Christ took hold. He had a cross of metal set with stones, and, in a glass, a rubble of pig's bones. And with these relics, any time he found some poor up-country parson to astound, on one short day, in money down, he drew more than the parson in a month or two, and by his flatteries and prevarication made monkeys of the priest and congregation. But still, to do him justice, first and last, in church he was a noble ecclesiast. How well he read a lesson or told a story! But best of all, he sang an offertory, for well he knew that when that song was sung he'd have to preach and tune his honey tongue and, well he could, win silver from the crowd. That's why he sang so merrily and loud. Now, I have told you shortly, in a clause, the rank, the array, the number, and the cause of our assembly in this company in Southwark, at that high-class hostelry known as the Tabard, close beside the Bell. And now the time has come for me to tell how we behaved that evening. I'll begin after we had alighted at the inn. Then I'll report our journey, stage by stage, all the remainder of our pilgrimage. But first, I beg of you in courtesy not to condemn me as unmannerly if I speak plainly and with no concealings, and give account of all their words and dealings, using their very phrases as they fell. For certainly, as you all know so well, he who repeats a tale after a man is bound to say as nearly as he can each single word, if he remembers it, however rudely spoken or unfit. Or else, the tale he tells will be untrue, the things invented and the phrases new. He may not flinch, although it were his brother. If he says one word, he must say the other. And Christ himself spoke broad in holy writ, and, as you know, there's nothing there unfit. And Plato says, for those with power to read, the word should be as cousin to the deed. Further, I beg you to forgive it me if I neglect the order and degree and what is due to rank in what I've planned. I'm short of wit, as you will understand. Our host gave us great welcome. Everyone was given a place, and supper was begun. He served the finest victuals you could think. The wine was strong, and we were glad to drink. A very striking man, our host, withal, and fit to be a marshal in a hall. His eyes were bright, his girth a little wide. There is no finer Burgess in Cheapside. Bold in his speech, yet wise and full of tact, there was no manly attribute he lacked. What's more, he was a merry-hearted man. After our meal, he jokingly began to talk of sport, and, among other things, after we'd settled up our reckonings, he said as follows, Truly, gentlemen, you're very welcome, and I can't think when, upon my word I'm telling you no lie, I've seen a gathering here that looked so spry, no, not this year, as in this tavern now. I'd think you up some fun if I knew how, and, as it happens, a thought has just occurred, and it will cost you nothing on my word. You're off to Canterbury, well, God speed, blessed St. Thomas answer to your need, and I don't 
worked out before the journey's done, you mean to while the time in tales and fun. Indeed, there's little pleasure for your bones riding along and all as dumb as stones. So let me then propose for your enjoyment, just as I said, a suitable employment. And if my notion suits and you agree, and promise to submit yourselves to me, playing your parts exactly as I say, tomorrow, as you ride along the way, then by my father's soul, and he is dead, if you don't like it, you can have my head. Hold up your hands, and not another word. Well, our consent, of course, was not deferred. It seemed not worth a serious debate. We all agreed to it, at any rate, and bade him issue what commands he would. My lords, he said, now listen for your good, and please don't treat my notion with disdain. This is the point. I'll make it short and plain. Each one of you shall help to make things slip by telling two stories on the outward trip to Canterbury. That's what I intend. And, on the homeward way to Journey's End, another two. Tales from the days of old. And then, the man whose story is best told, that is to say, who gives the fullest measure of good morality and general pleasure, he shall be given a supper, paid by all, here in this tavern, in this very hall, when we come back again from Canterbury. And, in the hope to keep you bright and merry, I'll go along with you myself and ride all at my own expense and serve as guide. I'll be the judge, and those who won't obey shall pay for what we spend upon the way. Now, if you all agree to what you've heard, tell me at once without another word, and I will make arrangements early for it. Of course we all agreed. In fact, we swore it delightedly, and made entreaty, too, that he should act as he proposed to do, become our governor, in short, and be judge of our tales, and general referee, and set the supper at a certain price. We promised to be ruled by his advice, come high, come low. Unanimously thus, we set him up in judgment over us. More wine was fetched, the business being done. We drank it off, and up went everyone to bed without a moment of delay. Early next morning, at the spring of day, up rose our host and roused us like a cock, gathering us together in a flock, and off we rode at slightly faster pace than walking to St. Thomas' watering place. And there our host drew up, began to ease his horse, and said, Now, listen if you please, my lords. Remember what you promised me. If evensong and matins will agree, let's see who shall be first to tell a tale. And as I hope to drink good wine and ale, I'll be your judge. The rebel who disobeys, however much the journey costs, he pays. Now, draw for cut, and then we can depart. The man who draws the shortest cut shall start.